I uh, would like to welcome all of you here today for the fiscal year 2016 preliminary budget hearing for the Department of Citywide Administrative Services. Uh, I'd like to in particular welcome Commissioner of the, uh, the Commissioner, Stacy Cumberbatch. Uh, we've spent a lot of time together over the past uh, year and we're really grateful to have her on board and her leadership. Uh, I think we'll hear from today's testimony that DCAS has been very responsive, whether it's been talking about the civil service and replacing thousands of patronage positions uh, with civil servants and uh, taking a much stronger role. Uh, at last year's hearing, we brought up issues relating to uh, civil service exam timelines that were exceeding 400 days, and uh, now we are in the 200-day range, which is absolutely amazing. Uh, this is literally an agency that uh, it has been incredibly responsive and part of a new progressive administration where <clears throat> it is less adversarial and more about us bringing things to each other's attention and working together to make things much better in this city. Uh, a lot of people may not know DCAS because uh, it's everywhere. It's one of the larger city agencies and sometimes my uh, colleagues look at me and say, DCAS has oversight over what? Uh, but that is the nature of it, and that is actually one of the reasons I wanted to uh, take be, be chair of governmental operations because of just how extensive DCAS is. Uh, it's responsible for many citywide functions and ensures the city agencies have critical resources and support needed to provide best possible services to the public. In the fiscal year 2016 preliminary budget, funding for DCAS totals $1.17 billion, with majority allocated towards paying the heat, light, and power bills for all city agencies which is budgeted at 800 million. During today's hearings, we'll examine many aspects of DCAS's operations and how they impact the city's budget. Specifically, we would like to discuss the city's energy policy, the efforts to centrally manage and lower costs for city vehicles, fleet, city-wide procurement and contracting, and asset management. We want to talk about our efforts to, re <clears throat> to reduce city-wide spending by leveraging the city's purchasing power and to implement strategies to streamline various citywide operations. Also, we'd like to hear details of the city's new Built to Last initiative and effects of Vision Zero on DCAS, the results of the new preliminary mayor's management report and several other new, new, uh, new needs found in the preliminary budget. Uh, as is the, uh, uh, I'd like to first recognize that we've been joined by the chair of the courts committee, uh, which, Incidentally, one of the things that DCAS has oversight is our court buildings. Uh, and in fact, if any of you watching would like to rent one of our court buildings, you can find it at the uh, Halls of the City, a program run by uh, DCAS where you can actually rent the court. Uh, we have a practice of swearing in and requiring affirmations from members of the government. So anyone who is interested in testifying or will be called upon to testify, on our behalf of the uh, commissioner, if you could please turn your mics on and uh, affirm to tell the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions. Thank you very much. If you may proceed with your testimony. Uh, good afternoon, Chair. Kalos and the committee, uh, Councilman Lansman. Uh, I'm Stacy Cumberbatch, Commissioner of the Department of Citywide Administrative Services, known as DCAS. Uh, I'm joined here at the table uh, by my counsel, Suzanne Lynn, and Chief Financial Officer, Rich Badillo, as well as members of my senior staff to discuss the plan expenditures and revenues for FY15 and FY16, as well as highlights of DCAS's capital plan. Thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. It's been a pleasure working with you over the past year, and we look forward to continuing a productive and collaborative working relationship. So just very briefly, an overview of what we do. As you know, DCAS serves other city agencies by making sure they have the critical resources and support needed to provide the best possible services to the public. One year ago, I was appointed by Mayor de Blasio to serve as the commissioner of DCAS. Since then, I've assembled, assembled an experienced, highly skilled, and diverse senior team. Each of us is dedicated to providing our customers with the tools they need to support this administration's goals of equity, growth, resiliency, and sustainability in carrying out the business of the city. We are the back office of the city, 
and it's our job to make everyone else's job easier. So that's the people of the city of New so the people of the city of New York get the service they expect and deserve. We have improved our customer service on the front end, better anticipating the needs of our sister agencies. We maintain a world-class fleet of cars and trucks. When things are happening that naturally, attract and train a competitive and diverse workforce purchase goods and services at the lowest price from local sources when possible, work to solve the city's office crunch while making sure our public buildings truly serve the public. All of this and more falls at the doorstep of DCAS, and we're up to the challenge. DCAS is organized into seven lines of services which directly serve our constituents. Energy management. DCAS's energy management line of service is responsible for monitoring and paying the city's heat, light, and power bills. We work closely with the Mayor's Office of Sustainability and play a central role in one city built to last. The initiative to reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 35% 20, 20, by 2025 and by 80% by 2050. We evaluate and fund projects that are proposed and managed by other city agencies to reduce energy consumption. They include projects such as replacing inefficient boilers, heating, ventilation, and air conditioning systems, installing better lighting and other systems in city-owned buildings. Energy management also trains building maintenance staff on energy-saving techniques. Uh, we're also growing the city's clean energy resources by installing so, uh, solar photovoltaics on city buildings. Fleet. Our citywide fleet line of service monitors the city's fleet and overall compliance with purchasing laws and environmental goals. We help manage nearly 27,000 light, medium, and heavy-duty vehicles. This represents over $2 billion in assets. We also oversee the largest municipal fleet of alternative fuel vehicles, such as hybrid, electric vehicles, and natural gas vehicles. We've also played a critical role in the implementation of, Vision Zero, of the Vision Zero initiative. This includes providing defensive driving training to city government workers. To date, we've trained over 17,000 employees with a goal of training 20,000 staffers by the end of this fiscal year. Fleet is also overseeing the implementation of the Truck Guard Installation Program. DCAS will install 240 city trucks with side guards in 2015 protecting pedestrians, bicyclists, and motorists, motorcyclists. This is the largest rollout of side guards in the nation. Fleet is also overseeing the installation of vehicle tracking units called can sievers on city-owned vehicles. This, this will help improve the driving behavior of city vehicle operators and reduce collisions. Data collected from can sievers includes speed, hard braking, or accelerating and seatbelt use. So far, over 16,000 units have been installed. Human capital. The human capital line of service provides civil service administration for approximately 223,000 city workers in both mural agencies and other governmental entities. Our core belief is that we can provide world-class services to our constituents in an atmosphere of equity, inclusion, and increased opportunity for professional growth. We're collaborating with other agencies, labor unions, and the city council as we move forward with an aggressive agenda to strengthen the civil service system. On February 7th and 8th of this year, we administered the sanitation worker exam to 75,000 candidates. It was the largest civil service exam in over 20 years. Human Capital also develops and administers approximately 100 civil service exams uh, a year provides professional development and training to about 20,000 city employees, and processes personnel transactions through NICAP Central. This line of service also continues to oversee the city's provisional reduction program as mandated by the New York State Civil Service Commission. Under the plan extension, DCAS will address up to 8,600 provisional appointments over the next two years. We'll do so by administering 37 exams in addition to our regular exam schedule, and we'll also evaluate the titles uh, where 20 or fewer incumbents serve for potential classification actions. Asset management. DCAS's asset management line of service provides safe, clean, efficient office space for the city's workforce. 
We manage 55 public buildings with 15 million square feet of city-owned space and over 22.4 million square feet of lease space. We also purchase, sell, and lease real property. We locate and secure space for city agencies with a focus on more efficient use of office space as an important cost-saving action. Asset management is also committed to examining existing city-owned spaces and developing plans for how these buildings can be better utilized to improve the delivery of city services. Communications. Our communications line of services produces the city record, the official journal of the city of New York. It's published every weekday and contains official notices such as public hearings and meetings, procurement solicitations, selected court decisions, and bid awards. DCAS is working on making this information digitally searchable on our website within 24 hours of publication. In addition, all city record data will be available via the open data portal for the city. This initiative is scheduled to go live in August of 2015. Purchasing. The citywide procurement line of service purchases, inspects, and distributes supplies and equipment at the lowest net cost. Each year, DCAS purchases $1.2 billion of goods and services for the city through 1,000 citywide requirement contracts and one-time purchases. We leverage the city's purchasing power to obtain the most competitive pricing for goods and services by aggregating demand and consolidating contracts. DCAS seeks to maximize MWBE vendor participation through outreach. We also regularly attend vendor fairs. Currently, we're administering a citywide economic and environmental initiative called NYC Print Smart. The goal is to reduce the number of copying machines rented by the city, replacing them with fewer centrally located multifunctional machines. Citywide diversity and EEO. The citywide diversity and EEO line of service is responsible for ensuring that city agencies comply with the city's EEO policy and the city charter provisions and laws concerning equal, equal employment opportunity. Through strategic alliances with agency personnel and, and EEO officers, we promote collaboration and best practices and focus on establishing a model for effective diversity and inclusion, inclusion strategies. Each year, commissioners submit annual diversity and EEO plans, establishing their own accountability, which we measure quarterly. DCAS's expenditures. DCAS's expense budget reflects funding of $1.2 billion in the current fiscal year and fiscal year 2016. Included in this funding is our included, included in this funding is our budgeted headcount of 2046 in fiscal year 2015 and 2042 in 2016. The majority of our plan expenditure. 784 million in both FY15 and FY16 is allocated for citywide energy expenses. DCAS continues to work with OMB on the FY16 forecast and will report any changes in the executive budget. As previously mentioned, DCAS continues to work closely with agencies citywide to enhance the energy performance of their facilities through a range of programs, including retrofitting equipment, improving operations and maintenance, along with training and outreach to reduce the city's energy costs. Funding additions to DCAS. I would now like to discuss the major expense budget adjustments for citywide initiatives that are included in the FY16 preliminary budget. Fleet received 700,000 for the truck guard pilot program as part of the Vision Zero program. As mentioned, the goal of this pilot program is to install truck guards on 240 city-owned trucks in calendar year 2015. Energy management, energy management received incremental OTPS funding total, totaling $36 million across FY15 and FY16 for the implementation of One City Built to Last initiative. The additional funding will be used to expand ongoing energy efficiency programs that are not eligible for capital funds. This includes compliance with Local Law 87, of 2009, which mandates energy audits and retro commissioning for buildings exceeding 50,000 square feet. Through FY 2014, we completed 315 energy efficiency reports for firehouses, public libraries, schools, and other city buildings across more than a dozen city agencies. In FY 2015, we have 217 energy efficient reports in, in progress, 
with more than 300 planned for FY16. DCAS received funding for 18 positions at an annualized value of $1.5 million to dollars to support the expansion of energy programs under one city built to last. The personal service funds will be used to hire en energy engineers, project managers, and analytical staff, as well as legal contract and other support staff to assist city agencies in meeting the goals of one city built to last. Human Capital received $500,000 for six positions needed for the creation of two new units, the Office of Citywide Recruitment and the Office of Workforce Planning. Both units will play a major role in shaping the city, the city government's workforce, future workforce. The Office of Citywide Recruitment will build upon current relationships with high schools, colleges, universities, trade schools, and nonprofits. Staff will also expand recruiting efforts by providing extensive outreach to underserved and underrepresented communities. The office will also participate in job fairs and community-based activities to notify prospective job seekers about employment opportunities and civil service exams. Where feasible, the office will conduct site visits, host targeted recruitment events, and create internship opportunities. The Office of Workforce Planning's goals will be to provide in-depth analyses of the city's current workforce and develop an array of business intelligent tools and predictive models. This will allow agencies to better understand their workforce and develop best practices on how to deal with the issue such as succession planning. The data will also be used to develop a marketing and recruitment strategy to establish a pipeline of prospective applicants for city agencies. In addition, Human Capital received $800,000 that will be used to create 173 additional stations at the two existing computerized testing centers in Manhattan and Brooklyn. Human Capital also received $1 million to assist staff in the development of civil service examinations such as administrative staff analyst, administrative manager, fire lieutenant, fire captain, and computer software specialist a key component of our provisional reduction plan. Information technology received five positions and $500,000 that will allow DCAS to bring in-house the maintenance and enhancement of the electronic exam item bank. One of the goals of the enhancement is to increase the type of exams that can be administered at the computerized testing centers rather than at schools during the, the weekend. Information technology also received funding for four positions and $600,000 to create the computerized maintenance management system, which will help asset management in providing better and timelier maintenance at our buildings. This will include a work order system that will provide timely notification of facility issues and an inventory system that will allow staff at each of the buildings to monitor supply levels. This system will also help in the development of preventative maintenance program to identify building issues and correct them prior to major system failure, avoiding costly repairs. DCAS revenues. The total DCAS revenue budget is $61.6 million in FY15 and $60.2 million in FY16. Our largest source of recurring revenue is from the 460 leases for commercial rentals of city-owned property, projected to be $42 million in both fiscal years. Another significant revenue source is the sale of surplus vehicles and other city-owned equipment, totaling $6.9 million in both fiscal years. DCAS Capital. I will now turn to D the DCAS Capital Plan, which totals $932 million dollars together for FY15 and FY16. DCAS is undertaking a number of major construction, equipment, and energy conservation initiatives. Highlights of our program include Vision Zero fleet projects. DCAS continues to implement a capital project for $6.75 million to complete a citywide rollout of the EJ Ward fuel tracking system. This rollout includes can units for each vehicle that will download vehicle engine information, including speeding, idling, braking, seatbelt operation, and acceleration and location information. It will greatly enhance our understanding of driver habits and give us the ability to analyze and prevent collisions. Additional funding of 4.2 million has been added to the January plan to upgrade, upgrade older can units and fuel terminals already being used in NYPD vehicles. 
In addition to approving fleet safety, this system is an important part of our citywide fuel emergency plan, helping agencies to share and optimize fuel resources in the event of an emergency. Energy conservation and clean energy projects. There is a combined $262 million in capital funding in FY15 and 16 allocated for citywide energy conservation and clean energy projects. They include lighting upgrades, installing occupancy sensors, high efficiency motor installations for mechanical and plumbing systems, building controls, and clean energy installations. Sandy equipment citywide purchase. DCAS received $22 million in capital funds for additional emergency and storm-related equipment for use by city agencies. We ordered 35 fuel trucks, and we're completing contracts for generators and forklifts. DCAS city-owned capital construction. The DCAS capital construction program for city-owned buildings in FY15 and 16 totals $548.5 million. Major projects include the relocation of housing and civil court parts from lease space at 141 Livingston to 210 Jerome Street, an interior renovation of 345 Adams Street in Brooklyn to relocate agencies from 210 Jerome Street, an upgrade to the sprinkler system at 360 Adams Street in Brooklyn, an upgrade to the fire alarm system at 253 Broadway, uh, new and new elevators at the Queen's Supreme Courthouse in Jamaica. Construction to support the Civic Center program. DCAS has allocated $44 million for ongoing work to renovate office space, space for tenants relocating from 346 Broadway and 4951 Chamber Street. Projects include the relocation of the Summons Arraignment Park Court to the 16th floor of the Municipal Building at 1 Center Street, moving some of the Department of Education Parks and Recreation, Grow NYC, and Trees, N Trees NY to the third and fourth floors of 100 Gold Street. Lease space construction projects. The DCAS capital program for the construction and outfitting of lease space in FY15 and FY16 totals $77 million. Projects include the relocation of the Department of Finance from 210 Jeralman Jerome Street and 345 Adams Street to a space that has yet to be identified, the relocation of the Taxi and Lim Limousine Commission and the Office of Administrative Trials and Hearings from Queens Boulevard to 47th Avenue in Long Island City, a consolidation of offices for the Office of Payroll Administration at 450 West 33rd Street. In conclusion, I want to thank you for the opportunity to testify about DCAS planned expenditures and revenues for FY15 and 16, as well as our capital commitment plan. I'd be pleased to take any questions at this time. Thank you uh, very much, as is my committee's practice. Uh, when we're joined by members of the council who may have some brief questions, I will often defer to them so that they could ask their questions so that I can then go back to my more exhaustive question list that tends to take a little bit longer. So I'd like to recognize the courts committee chair, uh, Rory Lansman, to ask questions regarding our courts. Thank you very much. Good afternoon, Commissioner. It's good to see you again. Good afternoon, good to see you too. Um, so I do want to focus uh, my questions on your uh, operation and, and maintenance of, of the courts. Let me just see if I can get an update on some of the capital projects. You touched on, on at least a couple of them. Okay. Um, are you involved in the, tra in the moving of uh, Brooklyn Housing Court? And where are we at the, in that process? I know it's right. the very beginning of the process, but, but where are we and how are things going? That's correct. I want to introduce you to Ricardo Morales, who's the Deputy Commissioner for Asset Management, who oversees all of the, the city's real property with respect to offices and courts. I'm just going to minister the oath. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth before the committee and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Uh, to answer your question, we're still in preliminary stages of that. We still have to do a EULA process for both uh, the 141 lease and for 210. Um, but uh, we're very uh, um, looking forward uh, to the move from uh, 141 to 210. Uh, so we have done some preliminary, very back of the envelope uh, plans and have, do have some money uh, budgeted from ONB for the eventual construction of the new courthouse at 210. All right, so the, there's the lifespan of the project. 
when, when is it anticipated that the uh, new housing court will open, and then, and then where are we? And again, I understand the answer is going to be close to the beginning, but, but where are we? We're looking to see if we have it constructed, at least ready for functioning, of the courts within the next five to six years. And when do you expect to start the ULA process? I'm sorry? When do you expect We've to start? We've already started the ULA process in terms of starting certification pieces, uh, but the uh, per se filing hasn't happened as of yet. Certification goes first, uh, and I think we're ready to submit that. And we've been going back and forth on that for uh, uh, the last uh, several months, so we should be ready to have that uh, ready for public viewing soon. Got it. And can you uh, likewise give me a status update on, um, I think it's 346 Broadway? The, the currently where um, uh, Manhattan and Brooklyn summons court uh, is housed. Where are we, because that lease has expired, so we're moving. Right. Where are we moving to and how's that going? So um, we, we just got the okay not too long ago to move to one center street the 16th floor here in Manhattan. Um, and we're in a uh, preliminary stages in terms of our uh, construction and abatement. We're still doing our design piece. We're hoping to have that finished by the end of the, by December of 16. So, and meaning December 16 would be when the, uh, the new summons court be would able open to, up? The new summons court should be able to open at that time. That is correct. Got it. And, and until that time, we're still going to be in 346. We're just paying rent to the new. That's correct. Landlord. That is correct, yes. Got it. Is, it, is, is Brooklyn Summons Court also moving? Yes. To, Bo to, they're st they're going to stay together is my, my that question. That is correct. They will be staying together for this period of time. That's correct. Um, the Staten Island Courthouse, is that, is that you or, I mean, getting that, that you, thing no, ready? No, that's to, us. Or that's, the <laughs> or that's the dormitory authority. That, that's us. Um, yes. It seems almost cruel to ask you when that will be opening, it, but. We're, we're very close. What we don't want to do is, is actually receive the court without having a number of, uh, of issues resolved, and they're not punchless issues. There are actually some issues dealing with the elevators and other pieces. As soon as the contract that fulfills their end of the, the, uh, the, their contractual obligations, we'll be willing to accept uh, the building. And that will be soon, because we've been working for the last several months also to make sure that that is done, but uh, we're not accepting it until we feel that the uh, court is 100% functioning and the, and the contract is held to all of his uh, responsibilities. I had read, I think it was, it, was, it was last year, late last year, maybe it was more recently that um, March 31st was some kind of uh, either target date or schedule for, for doing some walkthrough to get the certificate of op occupancy issued, is that? It, it, I'm not sure, okay. uh, but uh, we have been pushing it on our end to make sure that the contract that does give us the building that we paid for. Good. Um, I know in your testimony, Commissioner, you'd mentioned the uh, elevators at uh, Supreme Court on Sutton Boulevard, mm -hmm. which I hear about all the time from my lawyers in Queens. I thought that that was a DDC project. Am I mistaken? So the, the money as the, my chief financial officer has informed me, it's in our budget, but it. the work gets done by DDC. Got it. So that one, they're the ones that we need to talk to about why it isn't done yet. Not you. Correct. Got it. Um, the $99.8 million renovation of the New York Criminal Court, uh, the Manhattan Criminal Court at 100 Center Street. Yep. Um, what is that work going towards? And I will tell you that last year when we sat down with um, DA Vance, he didn't know what that project was. Am I misunderstanding? Um, I don't believe it is totally scoped out yet. Okay. The money's been allocated. Um, the OMB through the court master plan, et cetera. So it's part of the OMB's court master plan. I guess they haven't put exactly what projects are going to be associated with the dollars, but the dollars have been allocated. So who In anticipation, would, obviously, that they're going to need them. Right. Who would be the one sitting down with the stakeholders in that building? Obviously, OCA, but the DA's office, um, depending on the work that's being done, docs. 
and saying, okay, here's how we're spending this $100 million. Is that DCAS or is that OMB or MACJ or someone else? Uh, it's a combination. So it's obviously the Mayor's Office of Criminal Justice Coordinator is the, the principal liaison um, between the city and the court system. Um, it would be obviously OCA, uh, OMB. Uh, we're, we are now in closer collaboration up front in terms of that planning process, and this is because we eventually get to take ownership of that building for maintenance purposes. So it's very important that we're at the table early on so we can also weigh in on some of those right. design issues because they become challenges down the road in terms of maintenance of these buildings and the cost associated with that maintenance. Right. Just be mindful, please, that, that sometime last year the, the DA's office felt like they didn't know what was... Uh, what was going to be what that project was 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 about now that concern may have been addressed uh, at this point but as that scoping goes forward just be mindful there are a lot of stakeholders in that in that building. oh and we are and and i should let you know i've met i met with the uh, manhattan da last year we have a very close working relationship as i said with the mayor's office for criminal justice coordinator that really does serve as our principal liaison but our staffs work very close in tandem probably more than any other administration. Uh, worked very closely in terms of all the planning and thinking around what to do with the Brooklyn Housing Court. So all those stakeholders were at the table up front to, to you know, ear their concerns and their interests of what they wanted to see going forward. I think at one of the hearings, maybe it was um, it was the, the Mayor's Office of Long-Term term Planning mm -hmm. um, or Resiliency or whatever they're calling their green folks. I had wanted to make sure that the Built to, to Last program was going to include the courts. Is it? And, and are you getting... Um, right, absolutely. So, so once... Are you getting cooperation from who you need to get cooperation from, and how's it moving forward? Yeah, a absolutely. I mean, the courts have always, you know, we pay, we pay the energy, power, heat, and light bills. So uh, as the, the, the agency that pays those power bills, et cetera, and we run our energy conservation, they've always been invited to participate in doing all kinds of upgrades. Is OCA, I guess what I'm asking, is OCA cooperating? Absolutely, we have a very, very close working relationship with on OCA. This, on this issue on as this well. On this issue and every issue pertaining to their buildings. We are okay. working with their facility, the head of their facilities management uh, team every day. So yes. Yeah. So my last question um, relates to disability access in, in the courts. I think you might remember last year there was a particular incident where a um, a prisoner was in a holding pen at uh, um, Manhattan Criminal Court. She was wheelchair bound. There wasn't an accessible bathroom for her. She ended up wetting herself and spending the day right. in that circumstance. Um, the next time she came, they made an effort to take her to a public accessible mm -hmm. bathroom, you know, right. properly guarded. Uh, is there any long-term solution for that problem in that court in particular? And, and does that circumstance exist elsewhere? Right. So one of the things that we have to understand that those circumstances, it was very unfortunate that it happened to that, uh, uh, to that person. But um, we're working very close with the Department of Corrections. And as you may well know about the court system, some of them are very old. And the way they built some of the holding pens and some of the holding areas, which are not DCAS jurisdiction, is the, the jurisdiction of corrections, are somewhat antiquated. We're working right now very closely with the Department of Corrections to see if we could start doing some facility planning to allow us to expand those areas and make that bathroom or other bathrooms accessible. As far as the non-correctional pieces, we have accessible bathrooms. That's where she actually got to go the second right, that, time. Right, around. that's where they took her the second right, time, right. 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 So, and so just as a matter of jurisdiction, we're working very closely with the Department of Corrections to be able to do that, because there are different jurisdictions within the, the criminal court systems mm -hmm. just because of the nature. You have the police, does, does you it have work the corrections, you, you have us. Right, and you have a, do you have, how does it work? They have a lease with you, or is there some memorandum of understanding, or it's just you deal with this space and we'll deal with the rest of the space? We de they deal with, because of the security nature of those spaces, it's fully in a, ju a jurisdiction of either one, the police department, the Department of Corrections, then the court offices, then us. Having said that, we're all working together. This is an issue that was pretty acute and uh, quite frankly, 
should have been addressed earlier. We took care of it. We're working on it very closely with our agencies. No memorandum of understanding, no leases. It's part of the public building. It's part of the courts, but it's the jurisdiction. You, you, ha you have to separate them by law. Right. Good. Well, I've uh, enjoyed working with you. I appreciate the cooperation uh, that you've given uh, me and, and my committee, and um, I do look forward to continuing to work with you on these issues. Great. Thank, Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now on to all things non-court related. <laughs> uh, <laughs> with, with regard to the uh, PMMR, uh, with my background running companies, I've always focused on goals, uh, meeting those goals and measuring those goals. I even run my office the same way. They can read about it in Fast Company. Uh, in reviewing uh, your report, I found a lot of places where there were no goals, uh, where there are a lot of asterisks, specifically in uh, your first goal. Uh, help city agencies fulfill their workforce needs, increase the public's access to information about employment opportunities in city government, as well as ensure a competitive and diverse candidate pool for city employment opportunities. So in both cases, your agency has set no goals for the coming year, which is troubling considering how important those are to our administration and I also know to you as the commissioner. Um, and just, I guess the question is, for the final management, mayor's management report, will you be providing goals? Goals meaning in terms of your target goals for fiscal year uh, 16. So um, uh, do you have a goal for the number of applicants received for open competitive civil service exams in fiscal year 12 is 112, fiscal year 13, 75,000, FY 14, 74,000. Uh, in fiscal year 15, in your first four months, you actually had 124,000, but there are no targets for fiscal year 15 or the coming fiscal year 16. And then similarly, we have a very diverse workforce, but we have no goals with regards to the diversity we'd like to see. Okay, so part, part of, and, and we've had this discussion before, is that our role at DCAS is to obviously administer the civil service system, which is really um, grounded in giving competitive exams. And when we, for this fiscal year, uh, our human capital division has laid out what exams it anticipates given, giving over the next fiscal year, and that's based on feedback from agencies, their needs, as well as looking at uh, workforce data to figure out where there might be uh, greater numbers of attrition, and therefore we will need candidates to presumably fill those positions. So it's kind of difficult to put out a goal of how many applicants we might see in any given year, given the nature of how we do our work. Um, so for example, for FY, this fiscal year, we have a number of exams. So for example, san let's just take sanitation. Uh, uh, this, is, this is more of a general question because right. similarly we, we have, uh, we have a workforce that was 38.9% uh, uh, black in uh, fiscal year 12, 38.5 right. fiscal year 13, fiscal year 14 was 38.8, uh, four month actual for fiscal year 15 was 41.2, and yet we don't have a target for fiscal year 15 or fiscal year 16. Correct. So it's just a question of is, these are all indicated as critical indicators. This is something that is supposed well, to be. Well, I, th I think they're, they're indicated to be transparent about the racial demographic composition of the city's workforce. And the but we don't have goals. And the, and the philosophy of uh, the way we do our work is to do outreach to all communities mm -hmm. to provide opportunity to be part of the city career, city workforce. Um, and we are totally cognizant of where there might be historical underrepresentation of certain gender or racial groups in certain job categories. And part of what we were talking about earlier in our testimony around uh, starting an office of recruitment for the first time is to really look at all the workforce data coupled with where there's been historical underrepresentation to do some targeted outreach to different communities, whether it's racial or um, in particular neighborhoods, et cetera. We've not put racial goals to or any particular goals. or
right. All oh, right, that doesn't help. So why don't you come up in? Sorry. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, state your name for the record and I'll swear you in. Don Pinnock, Deputy Commissioner, Human Capital. How are you doing? You always have great answers for me. Uh, <laughs> do, you, do you affirm to tell the truth uh, before the committee and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. Okay, so with respect to setting goals um, for these two performance indicators, um, just to under underscore some of what um, Commissioner Cumberbatch has mentioned, it's very challenging for a few reasons. Since we operate a, a test-based system, really someone's selection into a job has to do more so with their rank on a particular list or their score on an actual exam as opposed to um, an ethnic group or a gender group to which they belong. So to establish um, goals surrounding that um, makes it extremely challenging because we are looking at a rank or a score. Um, however, with our work through the Citywide Office of Recruitment, right. We have um, a commitment to really casting a wider net, getting to those communities that have been underrepresented across job categories, and we use our workforce data to really inform our recruitment and outreach efforts. So you're, li like uh, so many times, you are, you are doing exactly what I would love for our city to be doing in terms of workforce planning. Maybe we should train people for the jobs that are actually needed, and uh, that being said, my question is, I, I know that this is something that Bloomberg was particularly interested in. How, how is this duplicative of existing programs like Workforce One or other programs that Bloomberg may have done and what other programs are currently in this sphere or is this uh, something that got phased out but it's getting phased in? What's going on within that sp this space? I think what's different about our work is that um, really and, and if you can share what else is currently in the same, this is what I ask startups when they want to pitch me on companies too. Like who are your competitors and how are you different? That's interesting. Um, with respect to our work in the Office of Citywide Recruitment, I would say we don't have any competitors for one primary reason. This is really the first time that we have dedicated resources to market New York City meaning to um, get um, the Ivy Leaguers, to get folks who generally go to not-for-profit, to get um, um, folks who work in non-traditional roles to be interested about career pathways within the city of New York. Um, a lot of the other groups, I think they primarily focus on really establishing more um, private partnerships with New York City to then um, have New Yorkers become gainfully employed in um, private institutions. And in terms of uh, your, the, the new office, will you be analyzing workforce trends with the jobs that we will need in the future? Will you be partnering with organized labor and, and uh, municipal unions and whatnot to uh, anticipate needs and, and begin to really plan things out so we're not uh, behind the curve, as it were, on trying to make sure we have people ready for the next right. generation that, of jobs? That's exactly what we're doing now. That's why we created the office. Um, you know, there was a workforce data report released December of 2013 for the first time for the city of New York, which analyzed every single title, you know, attrition rates, the demographics, et cetera. And I think I indicated this in testimony last year that, you know, in the next three to five years, what that report showed is that up to a third of the city's workforce will be eligible to retire. That could be 100,000 people, and we have that broken down by title. So one of the things that we're doing at DCAS is better planning and forecasting of where we're gonna need people and creating that pipeline. So for example, two of the titles where they'll, which we anticipate will see a large attrition would be the trades, all the different trades, carpenters, electricians, et cetera, as well as managerial titles. So in anticipation of that, for example, uh, last, in, last month, February, we opened up filing for manager, a series of managerial competitive exams that will start creating that pipeline, that list for people to take a test. So we'll have list and a pool of people in place in anticipation of, and that was part of our provisional reduction as well, but it was also looking at workforce data for the purposes of planning better for having a pool of candidates. We Ooh. are, sorry. Within, well, just as a follow-up, sorry for interrupting. Uh, within our uniformed services, somebody knows they go in at one level and every couple of years they'll be able to take their promotional exam and escalate up through the ranks. And so you start at one place and take four promotional exams and 16 years later you yep. know that if you're 
smart and can study for the test and pass the test, you're good, and that usually those tests are related to uh, doing better. And we're seeing that in uniform services. Uh, do, you, do you believe at least for the next uh, two years, uh, eight months and, sorry, eight months and uh, 20, 12, 12 days, well, we are at least guaranteed to be here, that um, we'll be able to provide a, a reasonable expectation for our city employees that they will actually have promotional exams on a timely basis and be able to depend on that moving forward? I mean, yes, but you know, again, and I don't know if we've had this conversation, I make a distinction between the open, you know, the entry level uh, civil service exam and the promotionals because part of the promotionals has to do with agency staffing needs and determination of how many candidates they might need you know, how many candidates they anticipate retiring in those more senior level positions and whether or not they need a test to be given for a promotional. So some of that is not, so that's what drives some of that opportunity, let's say in the next two years, but let's say they have a, a, a demographic of supervisor that might have more recently assumed those positions, then they may not need a promotional exam for certain titles within the next two years while they might, but I mean, those are the things that go into that determination, but the bottom line is we want to make sure that the system we're administering in terms of all these exams is fair, that it's transparent, that people understand uh, what goes into deciding to give a particular exam or not in conjunction with an agency, because we do this in conjunction with agencies, we don't do it in isolation, because we're trying to meet their staffing need. Mm -hmm. um, to make that a tr more transparent process, to make sure our exams are constructed in a way that are job related, uh, that have been tested for disparate impact, et cetera. So those are the key principles on which we give these exams and we wanna make sure that current city employees as well as those seeking to work for the city know that this is a fair process and they can see that it's a fair process, so. Now, um, I think I alluded to this in my opening, but I did wanna thank you in our, our first meeting. I. Uh, may have uh, harped on the 441 day median time from exam administration to list establishment in days. Uh, the fiscal year 15 goal was 360 days. Uh, so you took it down as a goal for a year. According to your four month actual for fiscal year uh, 15, you actually hit 244 days. Great. Uh, and so the question is, are you on track for where are you currently? And with regard to fiscal year 16, given your amazing performance, uh, can we, could, would you be willing to set more ambitious goals that reflect uh, surpassing your current uh, level of performance? Well, I wanna first congratulate Deputy Commissioner Pinnock and her staff I because uh, they came in and they looked at that issue. And as we said, part of that issue had to do with how we plan when we give exams. Right, so we have a better system in place of aligning what exams we're given with what actually agencies think their needs are gonna be, but more importantly, what is the data also showing us in terms of attrition and titles, so that we kind of align, align those two, whereas before, it wasn't aligned at all. It was just an agency said, I wanna give mm -hmm. these five exams, and DCAS gave those five exams, even if the agency might not need people for five years Right, so the exam was given and then a list was never published because there was no need to replace people off the list and that's what drove that day, those days between the time an exam was administered and the time a list was published. So that was a structural issue in the way business was being done, which we feel that we've corrected and is reflected in you know, the days being reduced now to 244. So why don't you give the new ambitious goal? Um, <laughs> Well, um, I may need to follow up with you just in terms of an ambitious goal because definitely um, it, it's something that we've thought really critically about. So in addition to um, some of what Commissioner Cumberbatch mentioned, my team and I have undergone um, a series of Lean Six Sigma exercises to really look at areas of redundancy and waste in our examinations process. So that um, tied with um, stopping the practice of just providing exams or administering exams solely at the agency's request, I think has definitely contributed to the reduction we're seeing. Um, but that being said, there are certain legal requirements um, that are involved with the examinations process that do take time, like the um, appeals process, the protest review sessions, grading. I'm not gonna go through the timeline I went through before. <laughs> you've but given it to us, you've actually submitted it. I really appreciate it, love the flow chart. So I guess what is, what do you think the, the right target is? Is it 360, is it 244? 
For right now, I would say that 360 is accurate because initially we talked about um, a 25% reduction once we implement certain recommendations, but um, we are looking to establish um, more aggressive goals as um, we become more efficient. And, and, and as we look at how it's been working and, and take that feedback immediately and adjust where we have to. So, you know, this is the first piece of it, right? And so we need some time to analyze, you know, where we, why we had the success we had. We think we know, but we want to test that and validate that. And from, that, from there, you know, we'll figure out um, if that goal needs to be adjusted going mm -hmm. forward. I just want to thank you. I, you've appeared before this committee uh, twice just on this one topic alone, and I appreciate it I, uh, on behalf of myself and uh, the labor chair, Danique Miller. So thank you. I'm, I think I'm getting better at this than I was my first time because I bounced back and forth and all of you had to change your seats. So I think I'm uh, done with that. Uh, oh. la when we first uh, sat down, um, last year I asked about increasing the number of uh, bids per contract in order to reduce price. And so in fiscal year 14, it was 3.3 and uh, your current goal is 3.4, and according to the four-month actual in the PMMR, you're now at 3.6. So Good I progress. wanted to say thank you for that, uh, and what, what, what happened there, and how can we do better, and uh, have we actually seen cost savings by having 0.1 more bids? So I'll have Deputy Commissioner Genith Turnbull, who is uh, citywide chief um, procurement officer for citywide procurement. So introduce yourself up here for these one in. I'm just going to uh, swear you in. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. Good afternoon. Uh, we're very proud that we have uh, been able to raise our number up to 3.6. One of the um, I initiatives that we took is we also are now submitting our bids on BidNet. So we're getting uh, a lot more uh, outreach on our solicitation statewide. We use BidNet as well as Crawl. C can you repeat? BidNet. BidNet. Yes, it's a uh, it's a organization where we can where we can put our bids out for the statewide um, folks to bid on. And what was the other one? Crawl, the city record crawl. City, oh, city crawl. record online. Yeah, online. City record yes, online. yes, okay. Right. So, in um, addition to crawl, we are now using BidNet. And it, w that's great. Please continue. But, so, that I believe has contributed to our uh, increase in terms of having more people respond to our bids. So, uh, before you question. got here, um, I, I had the law department here. Uh, we, we've actually re-changed re our, our, our schedule from most least controversial to most controversial uh, agencies are the ones where we tend to have people asking the most questions. Uh, so um, law department came, one of my favorite laws that we passed last year was the open law. It was introduced by council member Landrouse's co-prime sponsor. It was something I've been working on since 2006. So the law department now has to put the law online so anyone can see it. Um, they recently put it out to RFP, and uh, the only place they advertised it was city, the, the city record. So I actually had to ask, I, I will admit I do not read the city record every day. Um, and I do not read it cover to cover when I do. Um, and, and that's why I'm so enthusiastic about the changes that we've been able to make in the city record online, which was already online, but now it will be online with open data and open APIs, uh, which I think will be helpful. What else can we do to let the world of MWBEs and civic tech startups and uh, the business community know, hey, we have this money and we think that you might be interested in bidding on this and uh, we will save money because of the competition? Well, I think, you know, one, one thing, BidNet was one, like a vehicle. and, and because it's online, it's it's a, a place apparently where a lot of um, businesses go to bid on all kinds of government contracts here in New York State. And I think things similar to that in those particular industries. So as we, at least at DCAS, create you know RFPs or, or bids, we can look for if a bid is you know really pertaining to a particular industry, besides putting the city record and on bid net, we can focus on 
the professional, the, the um, business organizations that oversee that industry, for example, and make sure we do a, a targeted solicitation to them and outreach so that they can reach their members as well. That's, that, that would be the most obvious thing. Uh, the other thing that we do do in terms of WMBE specifically is we participate in a number of fairs. We've participated in fairs with SBS, um, Small Business Services, because they are the prime coordinator along with MOX of the city's WMB program. So we make sure that we're active participant in any of the fairs that they give. DCAS is there. Um, you know, to talk about our business, what, what things are out there in terms of solicitations and RFPs, um, and how you can go to the city record or some of these other uh, online vehicles to um, find out about what we have on the street. We've also partnered up with uh, CUNY, and we also participate in CUNY's uh, fairs. I guess I'm just trying to figure out how do we get the RFP. So, for instance, the, so there's, I'm just thinking specifically about the open law RFP. How do we, how do we get that from the city record out into the public and make sure every single thing that we're putting in the city record is not only getting out to BidNet, but just to the largest swath of people. And like when it comes to software, we have like the New York Tech Meetup. I would love to make sure that the 20 something thousand entrepreneurs and 10 companies there knew about a way to subscribe to the uh, different RFPs that so they can we, get. We'd notices. love to work with you on this. And, and if you have some great ideas for how we can push out the city record to those communities, uh, we'd love to work with you to make that happen. So we, we are now fully, I think, on city record. So. Um, I want to first thank you for your support for the legislation for helping make that happen and for the fact that it was already being published online and searchable but of course we're now in a world where searchable isn't where we want to be we want to be open data and then beyond open data having an open API so with regard to city record uh, I was pleased to hear that it's going to be live in August 2015 um, can you tell me a little bit about well, tell the public, I think you've been kind enough to have me briefed a little bit about the progression there. Um, so are you doing it with your own team or are you contracting it out? Uh, what kind of code base are you using and what can people expect in August of 2015? Um, it's being done in, what, why don't I get our technologists up here? Here, you can sit. Okay. And again, thank you so much okay. for doing this. Sure. So uh, Deputy Commissioner Nitin Patel, who's on uh, DCAS's CIO. Do you uh, affirm to tell the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? Yes, I do. Thank you. So the development of city record, the enhancement we're doing with our employee, it's not outsourced to anybody. We're working with Do It. Do It has already NYC open data. We're using that technology. So city record online always there. What we're changing is it's more searchable. So the fields, when last time we met, we were talking about, suppose I want to find out how many hearings in this, this area for this week. So we're trying to put, instead of a PDF searchable, now more the field level searchable, like the location, dates, and all those things. So all the fields are taken from there. Uh, so I guess the, the one thing, just as a follow-up question, would uh, DCAS agree to meet with uh, this committee as well as with these, uh, in partnership with these same civic community, civic technologist community that you're already working with on archiving, on archival issues to have them scraped and put into open data to also make sure that we, as we're getting closer to launch, uh, allow for uh, civic technologists to assist with code and um, so, so that would be part one. Could, could we? Well, sure, and we, we'll definitely meet. And then I think, uh, ha have you made any progress on normalizing data, which is for those of you watching or non-computer folks, it means making sure that the data that you're taking in is taken in in a way that allows us to do the most with it. So instead of taking in an address as just plain text, taking it in as street number, street name, uh, zip code, et cetera, uh, so that we can throw it up on a GPS type, uh, sorry, on a, on a mapping system. We are standardizing those. So what we're doing is with the city record online, we are trying to put those fields and also editable so everybody will use the same kind of a data where zip code, location, street address will be populated. And, and with it will be normalized. regard to the additional feature of just making sure that we tag not only the hearing location but the hearing topic. Hmm. So for instance, uh, 
we at the city council here at the city hall and zip code 10037 uh, will hear something about a sidewalk application uh, in zip code 10028 and making sure that both pieces of uh, geographic information okay. are yep. maintained. Right. Uh, so I think, and then for August 2015, software is very similar to the city of New York. It will be amazing when they are done building it. Mm -hmm. um, is this the, the final end all be all or do you have a commitment to continue maintaining and improving upon it? Yep. All, all, for any, any, just to be clear, for anything that we do on the technology side, we'll always be reviewing and looking at it, upgrading it, changing it, yep. tweaking it uh, where necessary. Great. Um, I'd like to uh, move on to talk a little bit about uh, the uh, fleet and Vision Zero. Okay, thanks, Mike. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Oops, sorry. No. Yeah. So, with regard to uh, fleet, I'm really pleased to hear that uh, the 240 uh, vehicles of over 10,000 pounds will be uh, receiving the uh, protection so that mm -hmm. pedestrians and bikers and motorcycles, and even in some cases cars, uh, don't get trapped under them. D is that all the trucks we've got in our fleet or just trucks of over 10,000 pounds? It's, that's a pilot, actually. Okay, 140 so is a pilot. So how, how many to roll it out to every single one of our, our, our trucks? Okay. Um, Keith Kerman, the Chief Fleet Officer. Uh, do you affirm to tell the truth before this committee and respond honestly to council member questions? Yes. Thank you. So the city has 9,000 total trucks. There are 4,500 that we determined with our, in our study with Volpe, which is the United States Department of Transportation, would be eligible for side guards. So the phase one or the pilot is 240 units. It's 5% of that fleet. And that'll be done this year. And then we'll assess how that goes and, and, and then look forward. Uh, the, the side guards have become industry standard throughout the, the country. And, and in fact, we, we really need them on our MTA vehicles. Is there a reason why we did a pilot instead of just going straight for it? Well, side guards are standard and have been for decades in Europe, in the UK, in, in some other parts of the country. At this point, they're actually fairly um, uncommon in North America, and um, you know, our pilot will be the largest rollout, might already be, um, of side guards in the States. So we're trying to lead in this and really make this standard in the United States. Um, but, but there's some work to do to get there. Is there additional funding for uh, fiscal year 16 to roll it out beyond the 450 vehicle pilot? Not, Not yet. Uh, first, we're doing the, the pilot program, which will be done in this calendar year. And then again, then we'll look to, to move forward, including as right now we're retrofitting, but the ideal and better way would be to start designing these into vehicles as we buy them. As a council member who, who sponsored the right-of-way law and which provides a protection for our city employees and has now sponsored introduction 663 to provide further protection for our MTA employees, um, I, I'm committed to making sure we do everything we can to make our vehicles uh, as, as, as un uh, make them less deadly if possible and these side guards are something that people are clamoring for. And, any life that we can avoid. Um, and, and so my understanding is, and correct me if I'm wrong, a side guard, if a person gets struck by a vehicle or collides with a vehicle, it prevents them from then getting caught in the undercarriage or then under behind the, the rear wheel. So this could be the difference between an injury or uh, a fatality. Um, you know, we too are committed. This is a, a priority of Mayor de Blasio to make sure that um, we can do everything we can do in terms of the public fleet to make it safer. So we're very, um, we anticipate that we, the pilot will be successful and that we'll see how we can roll it out going forward, but it's a priority of the administration as well. Great. Um, with regard to can uh, what I think during our last hearing we talked a little bit about 
GPS on all the vehicles. Is this that GPS or is this something different? It's, it's, the G, it's an, an effect, go ahead, Gabe. Yes, so the conceiver really does two things. It's a GPS, um, an AVL, automatic vehicle location unit. It's also a download of the engine computer. Okay, and in terms of the uh, data being used, are you also using it to deal with, uh, I think one of my favorite terms of art from the legal field, uh, frolic and detour? Uh, are you familiar with that? Uh, it's, it's, uh, it is a, it, there, there is a limitation of liability for frolic and detour when somebody takes a, a vehicle owned by somebody else and uh, was supposed to go to point A but stops at points B, C, and D along the way unless the person has prior knowledge that this person might do this because of a previous frolic and detour, uh, there is a limitation of the city's life. I'm, I'm a, sorry, it's, a, it's a, a legal and academic question, but uh, it's also something that leads to reduced wear and tear on the vehicle and energy use and cost savings. We are certainly sharing um, this information with the agencies. You know, DCAS does not assign vehicles, the agencies assign vehicles and instruct them as to where to go. So agencies will have this information and be able to follow up and make sure that vehicles are going where they've been assigned and supposed to go. But they'll have that information for the first time to know where they actually went. Correct. So. Uh, on the topic of fleet, uh, you in fiscal year 14 you had 57% hybrid or alternative fuel. Um, fiscal year, uh, for fiscal year 15, you had a goal of 55%, which is somehow 2% lower than the actual. Uh, and uh, as of your four month actual, we're still at 57%. Um, can we change the target to 57%? Can we get better so that we are saving cost on fuel and uh, having a lower carbon imprint based on using hybrid vehicles? Sure, we, we wanna get up to 60 and, and higher. Um, if in the last three years, you know, we went from 28% up to the 57%, so a yes, lot of tremendous very progress. very good job on getting from 28% um, to 57%. To I forget, yeah. forgive me for uh, omitting that. And, and as we get further into the fleet, you know, a couple issues. One, really finding viable alternatives for pickups and vans, and we are working on that now. We just rolled out a 50 van natural gas program with the Parks Department and the Health Department, which could become a model for how to do that. Um, and also, honestly, getting an alternative to the Ford Escape Hybrid, which was our off-road hybrid SUV, but Ford dropped the hybrid. So that, that does impact. We need off-road vehicles in New York City? <laughs> Parks Department, Sanitation Department, lifeguards, absolutely. Okay. Sorry, there, there's a joke amongst many that with all the potholes, you need an off-road vehicle to get down our city streets. Uh, something uh, that I just want to, while we're on Vision Zero, I do want to talk about something that did surprise me in the PMMR, which is collisions in, in involving city vehicles. So in fiscal year 12, it was 538. In fiscal year 13, it was 579. In fiscal year 14, which is, again, we once half that time we were in a new administration, we were at 672. Um, comparing the uh, FY14 four month actual, we were at 181. Fiscal year 15, we were at 167. Um, you're doing great work on so many places. What can we do to make sure that city vehicles are not involved in uh, preventable collisions and how do we get that number as close to that vision of zero as possible? So as you mentioned, we did make progress in the first full year of the administration. So we have made some progress right now um, in fiscal year 15 and we expect that to continue. Um, a few things we're doing. One, we have expanded the defensive driving program, which is a day long program dramatically. Um, we are now training a thousand staff a month we're up to 17,000 staff in this administration in really just 15 months. Um, and it's our goal to have every authorized driver um, trained through DCAS and its, and its partners. Um, and we estimate that's about 33,000, not including police and fire who are taking care of that for themselves, so the, the non-uniformed emergency staff. Um, we are also looking at, in addition to the side guards, other things that we can do with the technology side, um, we're about to pilot driver alert systems, which would be interactive systems that would help a driver real time 
um, if they're veering from a lane, if they're about to collide with a car in front of them. Um, and we did finish very recently the city's first citywide collision tracking system. So this data actually comes now not from a collection of 50 different agency <coughs> reports, from, from a single system called CRASH, which DCAS manages with 50 agencies. So we do have a single collision management system now fully in place, it's a Vision Zero project, and we can better study, analyze trends, report out on collisions. And this MMR is the first MMR where the data came from our CRASH system. If you could pick a better name, that would be amazing. Uh, that this this is all in the right direction. Uh, you had to see this question coming. Uh, will this be available through open data? Some of the information. We will absolutely provide whatever data that needs to be, you know, um, offered through the law. And and the law department is a major partner and has been for for really the last two years in all the risk management projects and Vision Zero projects that we're doing. There is uh, the. The plow tracker, uh, MTA has bus time. Uh, how far away are we from being able to track our garbage trucks while they're going on their routes and collecting trash in the morning? Well, the Department of Sanitation manages the plow NYC program. That, right. that is not decaying. But they're using your GPS transceivers. Yeah, in fact, the transceiver rollout for sanitation um, begins in April, and um, it's one of the agencies that we need to complete and it begins in April, and so then you'll see the Cansievers. Um, it, it could take us three to four months to complete sanitation, um, and then that'll, they'll be fully up. And what the about the street sweepers? That's part of the so, sanitation. So plan. sanitation already has Cansievers on the garbage trucks that are used for snow, or how is, how do, where, is, where is the data that? Sanitation currently uses the Plow NYC program yeah. for its sanitation vehicles that plow and the Cansever rollout, we've completed 16,000 Cansevers citywide, but the sanitation trucks actually begin in April. The rollout so begins next month. Why are we putting in Cansevers if the sanitation trucks already have a technology that allows us to track where they are? Uh, the Cansever technology actually has additional functionality that Plow NYC does not. It's part of our fuel management system. It's an engine download that allows you to look at things like braking and accelerating. Um, so there, there's actually other data that comes from that. Do we also get data on when the tires are low or uh, when, other, when, when the vehicle's about to break down? That is something I'm hearing about in the private sector that you can... Maintenance codes, yes. Okay. Tire pressure is not an engine indicator, so no. Okay, so we will be able to use this data to pull vehicles off the road and say, okay, let's fix it rather than having to tow it. And uh, that is, so um, will we be able to have access to this data? Um, a lot of people in my district complain that we don't get uh, street sweepers and we get locked in a lot of a problem where the district says we didn't get swept. TSNY says, yes, you did. It would be really great to be able to just pull the data and say, hey, look, we have this data and it shows the, the street sweeper going 30 miles an hour, which means it was passing cars in the lane uh, versus going whatever speed and, oh look, this street sweeper never even made it here. Similarly for garbage pickups, which we've had trouble with given the snowstorms. Sure, so yeah, at, as we complete the rollout, which again, it will, you know, it's 5,000 plus vehicles, so it'll take us some time starts next month, then we'll work with sanitation in the law department and our IT on, on how, to, how to make that information available. And in terms of the collisions, um, you've shared the location of every single one of those collisions uh, and are working with the agencies to say, hey, maybe if this is a, a garbage route or something like that, this is probably a bad place to continue to have them make that left turn or right turn. Yeah, agencies are part of the, the crash information goes regularly to agencies at, at, at a, with a lot of detail. Uh, I would love to see the open data. I would love to see crash provided with a public version so people can look at it, and I would love to see it personally. Um, let me move on to energy, unless there's a question I missed on Vision Zero. Oh. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you for all the work you're doing. Uh, but as you can see, we're, we're data hungry. And With regard to energy, this is another place where I was concerned about not seeing goals. 
Uh, so goal five of the PMMR, manage energy use by city agencies, assure that energy purchases are cost effective and reduce the city's energy related carbon footprint. Neither of these has goals despite the fact that we've recently passed legislation on point. Uh, one key question I had was first just how can I and the rest of the general public read it in that for fiscal year uh, there is a critical indicator uh, estimated reduction in greenhouse gas emissions from energy retrofit con uh, conservation project in metric tons. So fiscal year 12 is 7,021, fiscal year 13 is 4,115, and fiscal year 14 is 6,621. Is that from a baseline or is that cumulative from the previous year? Good afternoon, I'm Emily Dean, uh, Deputy Assistant Commissioner with DCAS Energy Management. Hi, Emily, do you affirm to tell the truth before the committee and respond honestly to council member questions? I do. Thank you. So in answer to your question on the um, estimated reduction in greenhouse gas emissions shown in the um, PMMR, um, th we actually identified um, a data quality issue with the FY12 number. So we took the initiative to correct it for FY13 and going forward. Um, to speak to the targets stated for FY15 and 16, uh, we don't typically participate in the PMMR, um, so, those, so these numbers are just placeholders. However, um, we do expect a significant upward trend in greenhouse gas reductions um, due to the One City Build to Last initiative. And we are also working closely with the Mayor's Office of Operations to incorporate One City Build to Last uh, metrics in the upcoming MMR. And I guess the quick question, so is there any, will you be able to fix the data quality for fiscal year 12 in terms of providing the right number there? Yes. Okay, and then with regard to the numbers, are they from, are, are they, do they represent reductions from a baseline or are they cumulative? I, um, I'll have to get back to you on that. Okay, so, so just to be clear, is it that we're saying that the baseline is 100,000 uh, metric tons and in this year we, we hit 94 and in that year we hit uh, 95 or is it uh, first year we hit 95 and then the next year we hit 90 and we continue to right. so th that would be the uh, question and then along the same lines goals energy retrofit projects completed energy efficient reports completed would, would like to have that I think you also have non applicable for the four month actuals which leaves me unable to really analyze that. Um, also, um, with regard to total energy purchased in, in, in trillions of British thermal units, um, there is no data regarding um, the four-month actuals or your targets. Um, so I guess that left me very, it left it very difficult for me or a member of the general public to get an understanding of whether or not we are getting return on investments for all the energy retrofits that we are doing. Are these? So can you quantify for us for, for each of the projects that we're spending money on through one city built to last, or at least specifically Plan YC, which is data we have, um, what kinds of cost savings have we seen? So we've spent X million dollars on Plan YC's initiatives, and that has resulted in Y million dollars in savings, if you can share that. I can speak to the energy reductions that we're, that we're anticipating. So according to the latest greenhouse gas inventory published by the Mayor's Office of Sustainability in the fall of 2014, um, city government had a greenhouse gas reduction in its footprint of 16%. Um, so we are seeing a, a reduction in energy consumption. Um, it's, it doesn't necessarily link up to, to budget because there are a number of other factors considered in the heat light and power budget. As you're examining, sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I want, if you had something to add, I would love to. No, hear. I was trying to to understand your earlier question. You were asking about the 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 savings with respect to each single project. Right. So again, from the finance world, somebody comes to me and says, um, I, I I ran a venture vehicle. We had multiple subsidiary companies, and somebody would say, well we'd like a million dollars. And we'd say, okay, what are you gonna do with that million dollars? And they'd say, well, we're gonna retrofit and uh, we're gonna put solar cells on the roof and we're gonna be able to sell, save $100,000 over the next 10 years, which is the lifespan of the solar cells. So it's a net zero indicator, but uh, people will love coming here because of it. Or it might have a piece where we actually have energy savings. But 
um, there's that. And I, I'm also curious, are you doing cost-benefit analysis on these energy retrofits? She'll answer it and how okay. we do it. So to your point, we do look at, we'd look at every single project for its cost effectiveness at reducing greenhouse gas emissions. So that's the dollar invested per metric ton reduced. Um, in terms of, you know, we look at other metrics such as simple payback, and we are also looking forward um, going to do more life cycle cost um, analyses. In terms of sort of verifying the reductions, um, we have uh, we have done some in-house bill analyses. Of course, this when we're talking about retrofit projects, we're we're talking about a single energy conservation measure, such as a lighting upgrade, and um, and that's hard to compare against you know a whole building's energy consumption. However, in in a, in a sample of buildings that we looked at, we found um, an eight percent reduction below the citywide average just on you know energy conservation projects that had historical data against which we could measure. Um, so we are seeing seeing those reductions. Um, we've also undertaken some measurement verification studies to dive deeper into the estimates so we can improve our estimates going forward and really ensure that um, what is being shown in for in terms of energy and greenhouse gas reductions estimated in projects will be delivered. Okay, I guess one of my concerns is just looking at the PMMR, which is a very limited resource at that. Is, um, I understand cost change. So there may not be a savings because maybe one year we use this, a lower number of kilowatts, but the cost of energy continues to rise. Uh, but what I'm seeing is that for the, the heating measurement, British thermal units and trillions, we, we are actually increasing. So in fiscal year 12, despite Plan YC and everything else, we went from 26.2 and 12 to 27.5 and 13 to 28.6 and 14. Uh, and then the electricity purchased kilowatt hours remains fairly constant over 12, 13, and 14 in terms of billions at 4.2. So um, I'm just curious, we're in, I'm all about reducing the carbon imprint, but I would like to see a, a measurable result and trying to better understand uh, that because it seems fairly, I, I think with the data quality issue, that also put me through a loop because uh, it, it seemed to have an irregular curve. So um, I think that as you're looking at the MMR, being able to provide us with indicators that allow us to measure the success would be very much appreciative. Um, with regard to the citywide heat and light power expenditures of uh, $800 million for the current fiscal year, does the city anticipate an increase in heat, light, and power expenditures for this fiscal year because of the winter? Uh, does DCAS, and then the other piece, which is actually the more important piece of the question is, does DCAS incentivize agencies to minimize unnecessary energy usage? So as to uh, this current fiscal year, we still have yet to reconcile uh, what the actual um, expenditure will be. What the actual expenditure will be, we haven't even received our February bill, as I understand, and, and that's when we, we think we took, obviously, the biggest hit because of February was such a bad month. So in the next couple of months, it, it's a process with DCAS and OMB and, and the energy uh, unit within DCAS to, uh, once we get those bills, to reconcile what the actual expenditures were. <clears throat> I want to thank you for this uh, considerably uh, long hearing and for answering so many of the questions and for your willingness to really take a look at the MMR and the PMMR to really investigate what's going on there and fixing a lot. Uh, thank you for all that you do in so many different areas. Uh, there are very few people who can come in here and talk about energy savings, retrofits, uh, quartz, uh, making our vehicles and fleet safer. Uh, Vision Zero and uh, civil service. Uh, it, it's quite a, a broad purview. I just want to thank you. We will, we will send you additional questions uh, sure. as a follow-up, but uh, I would like to thank you and so many other people from DCAS for uh, joining us and looking forward to working with you on uh